Okay. Didn't like what OBS did to the audio on the first pass, so I gotta redo the audio for this. Unfortunate. Gonna go fairly quick because everyone who is watching should be able to pause. This section's on cooling systems and picking a power supply. We'll do a brief review of diagnostic theory and then we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting. So Heat sinks are going to be a factor in this. CPU fans, case fans, liquid cooling, all of this matters. There's a number of different systems that can go into cooling off a computer. Because there's a number of different systems that make a bunch of heat in a computer. Your number one suspect is usually the graphics card, but also the CPU. So that's GPU, CPU, and PSU. It's always you. And the power supply very rarely has heat issues. They kind of have their own separate heating and cooling system or cooling system we'll show that in a second you don't have to understand all the physics of thermodynamics but you have to understand that the heat sink gets hot from touching the processor it takes the heat out of the processor into itself then we run air over it cool room temperature air passes through the heat sink the air heats up thereby stealing the heat from the heat sink that's it just run cool air over it and it cools it down so we have these two different types of air coolers here. They both just use air and copper piping to pull the heat out. The CPU goes at the bottom here or underneath in this one's case, and the heat travels up through these pipes into the radiator, and then we blow air through the radiator. That's enough to cool it in most cases. Because this generates a lot of hot air off of that fan, we want to pull cool air into the computer's case into the chassis itself, and we want to exhaust air out the back. So cool air in, hot air out the back, then we can heat up the air in the center and continually change that through this system. So it works in tandem. So fans on the front pull air in, the CPU fans, the GPU, they all create a bunch of heat here in the center of the case, and that goes out the top or the back. Some machines have what looks like a flat panel on the front, so you might wonder where they're pulling in air. It's off those little side sleeves, those little side vents here is where they're going to do most of their intake. And because hot air rises, there's these vertical cases. I've never built in one of these, but the principle is sound. You just aim all the fans up. So they pull cool air in underneath the feet here and ventilate upwards and exhaust it out the top just like a chimney. It's pretty cool. This is an Alienware. I included this just because even if it's a weird design, it's still subject to the laws of physics. Alienwares might be triangle-shaped, but it's still pulling in cool air on one side, heating it up through the processor and the graphics card in here, and then exhausting it out the back, venting it out here. Laptops, it's a little more complicated because they are so limited on space. They have to pull in cool air from wherever they can and exhaust it wherever they can. And their fans are usually these little flat um, rotary guys with different length of blades, different angles on the blades, because each length and angle of fan blade makes a slightly different frequency of noise. And if they're all slightly different, it sounds like less noise to the human ear. If they're all exactly the same, they all resonate together and you hear it. So that's why laptop fans are kind of weird looking sometimes. But you can see it's pulling in from the sides Pulling in from over here by the screen, it's not as concerned with these parts because those are parts that don't usually get hot. Um, processor gets hot, graphics card gets hot, RAM can get a little hot. Sometimes you don't want the battery to get hot. That's a chemical battery. And so the heat goes out away from the battery. Smart. Now the power supply, as I said, usually has its own separate circuit. You aim the fan down when you put it in the computer, You first of all. And it pulls in air that way and shoves it out the back. The side where the plug is in, that's where it's going to ventilate air. And it's going to pull it in through the bottom. So it doesn't kind of, it's not really affected by what's going on in the rest of the case unless it's extremely hot. It's sort of got its own thing going on. Now water cooling is the principle of this little clamp goes on the CPU. This little radiator goes up in the top and blows the hot air out. Keeps the radiator, keeps the little clamp cool. Keeps processor cool. So that principle, this one's an all-in-one, meaning you take it out of the box and it looks like this. It's already attached exactly like this. You just bolt it into place. But then 
A custom cooling loop is where you build every piece. You decide every turn, you cut, you shape these pipes. It's a lot more work. You Once you get it done, you have to make sure it's all sealed up properly, and then you put in the liquid. So it's a little more dangerous. You can make a very expensive mistake doing this. This example, let's see. Here's a, here's a simplified map of what's going on. The water block is touching the CPU, absorbing heat from there, pulling it up to the radiator. And then the radiator is pushing the heat out the back of the, or the top of the computer, then returning the water back down to the water block. It's very much how, like how a car works. And this is the setup process. This guy has filled up the reservoir with liquid, then he's pumping it out into the pipes to get them full of liquid, then he'll fill this again, and then the whole system will be full. And then it will look kind of like this. But you can see that if there was ever a leak or a break, you could just ruin everything with liquid. So water does stay cooler for longer. It's slower to heat up and can maintain a slightly lower temperature than air. They're not that much different. It's largely an aesthetic choice or a like cool factor choice. Okay, on to power. This is a modular power supply. It's semi-modular, we say. This cord's mandatory. This one goes to the motherboard. We talked about this in the previous section, I think. And then if you have a hard drive, of course, you add a cord, a power cord, run to the hard drive. You got a big GPU, big graphics card. You plug that in, you run that to the graphics card. And those are the only cables you add. You don't plug in all 12 cables. So this is cleaner. There's less mess. There's less cable management to worry about. It's just better. Modular is a very nice feature. Let's put that on Betty White's head. And efficiency is all about how much power it takes to deliver how much it promises. What we mean by that is, say, these are 90% efficient, is a 500-watt power supply is going to deliver 500 watts, no matter what. But if it's only 50% efficient, it's wasting 50% of the power. So you got to pump 100 watts through it. So it's going to pull 100 watts from the wall and then 500 go to the computer's parts. That's not very efficient. That's why these other ones that are 90% efficient to deliver 500 watts to your computer, they only have to pull like 550, 600 from the wall. They're very efficient. And for more detail on this, you can Google Velocity Micro, what is a power supply efficiency? And they have a very helpful article that explains it very, very well if you want to know more. You guys are already doing good on this, on your theoretical builds. You overbuild with the power supply a little bit, but not too much. The book says 30%. I think that's a pretty good amount to go by. So if you got a 500 um, 500 watt system, like graphics card, motherboard processor, everything's 500 watts, you probably want 650 or 700 to make sure that if the power supply loses power over time, which they do, it still has enough to run the computer. Or if you add another piece of the computer, then it's not overloaded. And you don't want to go way over because if power supplies are constantly running at half or less, if you got a 1,000-watt power supply and 400-watt computer, then this thing is just wasting for... It's a waste of money, first of all. And then they actually don't last as long that way. They last the longest when they're run at 50 to 80% um, capacity. So that's what you want to do. This is a power regulator. Uninterruptible power supply, UPS, there's a brand called APC, people sometimes call them that. But basically, this is a box with a bunch of batteries in it. It's got power plugs on the back, and you plug your computer into this. Then your computer is not plugged into the wall, it's plugged into this. And this charges its batteries via the wall. So if you're in a place with old wiring, inconsistent power, if you're having a lot of brownouts, power failures, if your neighbor's an idiot and he's digging around in his yard and he keeps knocking out your power, this will keep your computer running until the battery hits zero. And while it's got power, it will meet it out at a very steady rate. It will never damage your computer with its power output. So this is a very smart thing to have. Used to be you only put these on servers, but sometimes people just put them on their home computers if they're in an area that has lots of brownouts or power outages. I've thought about it during the pandemic. We've had a lot more power failures in Carbondale. So investigative method, you remember the basic principles to this. You reproduce a problem. You need to see it with your own eyes. Then you start listing all the possible things that could have caused it. Okay. You eliminate whatever causes you can. Okay, is it the hard drive? Is it software? Is it the customer made a mistake? How did this happen? If you need to swap or replace parts, you do that. 
And once you've done what you think you need to do, you make sure the problem is really gone. Make sure it's really gone. Never think you've solved it and just walk away without testing. Always confirm that you got it. Also, even you know the most wonderful, charming, intelligent, friendly customer in the world can lie to you on accident or mislead you on accident. They say, won't boot. But what they mean is, the power supply is dead. They just don't know that. So it doesn't turn on at all. Or maybe they said, won't boot, and some lights come on, but the screen never comes on. It does not post. That probably means motherboard. But they might also say, won't boot, and it's starting up, and you're seeing it try to launch Windows, and then it just can't find a hard drive. Well, again, they're still saying the same thing. Could be a completely different issue. And if it, they say won't boot and it gets halfway up, like, like you log in and it just never loads into the desktop, that's a software problem. That's not any of these other things. But a customer might describe all of those as my computer won't boot. And you don't have a lot to go on. This is why, again, you need to reproduce the problem yourself and identify uh, everything with your own eyes first. If you have to do drive recovery for somebody, drive recovery is a nightmare and no one should ever have to do it anymore. And everyone should be backing up their stuff in the cloud if it matters to them. And the number of days it has been since I've had a customer call me and say, will you rescue this file because I have not made any backups is zero. It happened to me today. Someone was writing a book chapter and the file corrupted and they couldn't open it. And they said, can you fix the file? No. No, you almost never can, and you need to back up your stuff in the cloud. Um, if you have to try this, typically pull the drive out, put it in a drive dock like one of these. There's one of these in G102. Uh, Rob uses one to set up the machines and tinker with stuff in another class. Super handy. These are like 20 or 30 bucks on Amazon. They allow you to plug in a hard drive, the USB into whatever computer you want, Mac, PC, doesn't matter, and you pull the files off. You could also take the drive and put it in another computer's expansion slot because many computers have more than one hard drive space. Like the Dells in G102, they could hold three hard drives in them, I think. At least two. And so you could just take drive from computer one, put it in computer two, get the files off of it, fix computer one later. Recovery services cost many thousands of dollars, and they don't necessarily get any more than you will off of there. There can be a big waste of money. But if it's a super important file, if you just have to have it, pre get prepared to pay you know a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars just for a small drive recovery. And admin permissions, this is usually gotten around by using a different computer. Like if you have a Windows hard drive and you can't get around the permissions on it, load it up on a Linux or a Mac. They don't care; they'll ignore it and pull the files off. But if it's encrypted, this isn't going to work. If the files are encrypted. Uh, you're probably not getting them back. That's the whole point. So, when interviewing the customer, some good questions you can ask to get to the bottom of the problem to get started. When did the problem start? Is it Did it start today? Did it start two weeks ago? I have some customers who are so stoic and never ask for help that I stop by and chit-chat with them, and they're like, oh, I haven't been able to print for six months. I'm like, oh, why didn't you call me? My office is 200 feet away. Oh, I didn't want to bother you. Okay, that happens. But when did it start is a pertinent question. What were you doing when it started? This is a tough one to get an honest answer in, but if you can't reproduce the problem, they say, it, oh, it crashes when I do this, and it doesn't, then you need more information from them. And you can make them feel like they're sort of part of the solution by saying, tell me what you were doing, or the next time it happens, write down the last couple of programs you opened. Oh, I opened a Chrome tab, or I tried to print. I tried to click send on an email, and then boom, the problem happened. Was the computer moved? A lot of times people will connect stuff, disconnect stuff, move computers without telling you. It's frustrating, but that's just something you should be ready for. Is there any new hardware? Yeah, I got a new graphics card, or I added a second monitor, or I got a new printer, and now this problem occurs. Okay, well, that could be a factor. The new new hardware or software could be the thing. I added new antivirus client. Please don't. Just rely on the one that's built into Windows and don't click dumb stuff. Are there any patches or updates? This goes both ways. Maybe there's a patch you need to apply for Windows. Maybe there's a new patch you applied, and now you have a problem because Windows patched, and suddenly Adobe Reader doesn't want to digitally sign documents anymore. That happens a lot. It's because one thing updates, and then maybe other things need to update along with it. 
The other one that's very common is you come to the customer's office and they have clicked cancel on those updates for six months in a row. So they have 85 Windows updates that haven't been um, installed. So their computer's acting absolutely insane is what happens when, when they do that. Is anyone else using it? Do you have any teenagers in the home? Kids tend to be less cautious. They tend to go on weird websites. You know, they start on Adult Swim and then they end up shopping on some weird weird mall or click too many ads or too too many whatevers, try to, to write and watch TV shows and movies for free and end up infecting the computer with other garbage wear. So you want to be aware who's using it. And if this computer is your computer for school or your computer for work, then you probably don't want to share it with anybody. Definitely not a teenager. And then, of course, can you reproduce the problem? Ask the customer to show it to you. When things are really severe, Windows has this blue screen. It used to just literally be a bright blue screen, and now it's this sort of soft blue with a sad face. And uh, you can scan this if you want. I've never had it lead to anything helpful. Uh, generally, you just generally you just have to reboot. There's no getting around it. There's no control alt deleting or recovering from this. The computer needs a complete restart, and the problem may just go away because it's usually a weird conflict or memory error or something like that can be caused by hardware incompatibility. You put the wrong thing in and suddenly it blue screens every time. Well, you got to take that thing back out. Software incompatibility. You install new software and it blue screens every time. Well, uninstall it. Boot in safe mode and uninstall it. It's overheating. Usually won't blue screen when it does that because the motherboards seem to have like a trip safety on them where when things get beyond a certain temperature, they just cut the power. So when I've seen machines overheat in the last several years, it's usually they just go black. They start to warm up, they go black. Linux world, the Mac OS world, we call this a kernel panic instead of a blue screen because uh, the way the operating system's built, everything runs on this sort of kernel, they call it. It's very similar to how Windows runs on a sort of substructure that still responds to DOS commands. Okay. Remedies for overheating. Well, there's hardware monitor. This is Open Hardware Monitor, and you can check it out. You can see it's current. This is a free piece of software you can download. It's safe to download. It will tell you the temperature and the voltage and the RPMs of everything it can possibly find in your computer. Whoops, my bad. Let me go back. You can see it's usually in centigrade. Typically, 75 or 80 is too hot. Over 80 is definitely too hot. 90 is you're about to ruin your stuff. 90 is probably where the motherboard's going to shut you down. And you want to also see that the graphics card is also in safe range, nice 50s. That's pretty cool for operating computer components. That's a little too hot for you to sit on, you biological monster. Um, let's see. So that's the monitoring software. There's lots of it, but this is my favorite one. You can also check the BIOS reports because, it was, as we see in this example, the BIOS has a thermometer and it's tracking the temperatures, tracking fan speed, giving lots of good information. This is a nice modern BIOS. One of the things that can cause overheating is dust. Dust gets in the computer. Remember, the front of the computer sucks in air, which means it sucks in dust. Some of that dust sticks to the fan blades. Eventually, that happens a few million times, and they are caked with dust. The fan blades get heavier, or they even stop turning altogether. So it just slows down the movement of air through the machine. So you open up, you want to look. If you see dust everywhere, then you probably need to clean it. If you don't see much dust, but the fans aren't moving, you might need to clean it, and the dust is just not that visually obvious. Verify that the fans are blowing the right direction. Yeah, we've also seen that, where someone builds wrong, and puts the fans the wrong direction. So they both blow in or they both blow out. And this just creates a whatever negative pressure situation and they can't they can't operate effectively. One side needs to pull air in and the other side of fans needs to blow it out. Then you have a constant wind tunnel of like, like a constant breeze blowing through your computer over the processor. If the case has room, you can install additional fans. This is a good move. Cover empty drive bays and slots. Most of these drives are designed to have their drive bay slots either covered or filled with devices. If you just leave them open or empty, then the airflow is weird and not as the architect designed it. It might not cool properly. There's also, you can get temperature monitors that are inside the computer, outside on the front of the computer or on the top. Then at a, at a glance, you know if it's overheating or not. This one's really fancy. And ZXT is really aesthetically good looking stuff. In the case of a fire, unplug it. Don't mess with it. 
Don't try to see what's going on with it. If a computer smells like it's on fire, looks like it's on fire, if smoke comes out of it, unplug it. Rip the plug out of the wall. Step away. Don't get hurt. Don't let anybody else get hurt. Don't mess with it. Unplug it. Let the fire go out. Or if it's, unfortunately, if it seems to be going along really well and spreading, you might have to spray your computer with a fire fire extinguisher. This is not good for anything, but neither is fire. So definitely let the system cool down. We will quiz you on this. And it's important that you understand that the first thing to do with a computer that's on fire is not touch it, open it, mess with it. It's unplug it. So when Windows is hanging a lot, could it be that the hard drive is loading slowly? Could it be that you don't have enough memory for your 30 Chrome tabs? Two gigs of RAM, Windows 10, and 30 Chrome tabs will crush a computer. Is the processor bugged because you have so much crap going on? Are you like making a, a giant zip archive, downloading something else, playing a video game, again, a bunch of Chrome tabs, and checking your email at the same time? You're just overdoing it. They're not infinitely powerful, and you've just run out of horsepower, basically. Is it malware? If you start up the computer and it's a decent computer, it's got good specs, it's got plenty of RAM processor, and it's not doing anything, and it's super slow, it might have something going on in the background. It might have malware on it that you're not seeing. So you should clean it or reinstall the operating system. Make sure you format the hard drive completely. Make sure you got rid of that crap. So an overheating CPU can be a lot of things. You might need a new cooler. The cooler might be loose. I saw a case once where the computer was totally fine while the person was doing Microsoft Word and web browsing, and when they went to play a video game, it overheated and shut down. That's because one of the four clamps that holds the fan on the CPU was loose, and the CPU was not cooling as well as it could. And it was, it was cooling well enough to type a letter, but not well enough to play a video game. Video games are more demanding. You can have overheating RAM, although it's rare. Overheating GPU, very possible. Uh, failing RAM, motherboard, CPU. Typically, these parts just go dark. One day, they just stop working and nothing's there. They don't act weird. And then you just have to replace them because they're too hard to fix, too hard to understand what's wrong with them. Electrical issues, such as playing dead, which is where the computer just will not turn on. Um, very rarely, very, very rarely, the power supply has just gotten into a state where it will not charge or it can't dissipate its existing charge. So you unplug it and let the machine sit for 15 or 20 minutes. What you want is called a cold boot to make sure that it's it's dead or not dead. No lights, no noise usually means no power. So maybe you're not getting any power or maybe the power supply needs to be replaced. Locks during boot sounds like a software issue to me. If it gets to the post screen, then that means the motherboard processor power supply, they're all probably fine. RAM's probably fine. Boots after several tries, again, sounds like software. Powers down randomly sounds like heat. That just sounds like it gets too hot and shuts down. Dead, but you can hear a whine from the PSU. That sounds like maybe motherboard, like the power supply is turning on, but nothing else is. Okay, that's basically the end of this section. We've got a quiz you can take on it for the next several weeks. And the lab we're going to do this week starting tomorrow and then of course Wednesday also is probably going to be USB booting. We're going to take out our test machines and use a USB drive. So please bring a two gig or larger, preferably four, six or eight USB drive. And we're going to put an operating system on it and boot your crummy little um, computers. We're going to boot the turds off of that. So you can understand how to reinstall an operating system on a computer. Okay. Then the next week, we might look at pulling off some processors and reapplying thermal goop. Pretty easy. This example up on the top left is extremely wrong because it puts it between the motherboard and the processor, thus probably ruining both. It also says Hellman's mayonnaise on the goo. That's not, not a good sign. The goo goes on top of the processor, like you see in these other examples, but they've sort of slopped it all over. This is way too much. So only a tiny little dab is all that's needed. You'll see when we do the lab. Thanks very much, and let's hope the audio is better this time.